All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are going to look at uh, communicable uh, disease epidemiology. In our first lecture about epidemiology, we looked at the fact that uh, epidemiology had its roots in communicable uh, diseases. However, um, epidemiology as a field has actually expanded to, uh, to look at uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, even genetic diseases, or even looking at diseases at the level of uh, uh, molecule, at the molecular level, uh, issues to do with uh, what we call uh, molecular epidemiology. Uh, so in this session, we are basically going to look at uh, uh, the, the, the unique things that are concerned with the spread of uh, communicable disease. So we shall look at the, um, the definition of, uh, of communicable diseases, we shall look at the modes of transmission of communicable diseases. Then we shall look at the natural cause, uh, the natural cause of uh, disease or communicable diseases, and then the patterns of diseases uh, and the patterns of spread of diseases. And then we'll look at the different modalities of controlling uh, communicable diseases. So communicable diseases are basically uh, diseases that are caused by infectious agents. Uh, these infectious agents can be viruses, uh, bacteria, uh, can be parasites that actually spread from one person uh, to the other. So examples of these conditions can be, uh, for example, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, typhoid, all these conditions that are spread uh, by uh, microbial agents. Uh, we can also use the term contagious to refer to communicable diseases because these are conditions that can actually be spread from one person to another. Um, another category of communicable diseases are those that actually can be transmitted uh, from animal sources to humans. So we have conditions such as uh, rabies, brucellosis, Lyme disease, and other conditions. Uh, so it is very important that we actually look at communicable diseases because um, we'll gain understanding of um, uh, the different infectious diseases and how they actually spread uh, in the population. Uh, so the study of uh, the infectious diseases and how they spread in populations is kind of what we term as communicable disease epidemiology. So. Now, um, the aspects that we actually study in uh, communicable disease epidemiology are uh, uh, the ways in which these uh, communicable diseases are spread from one person to the other. And then also we look at issues to do with outbreaks. Uh, we identify the points of, uh, uh, the, the points of spread of these outbreaks and then also the risk factors associated with these outbreaks. And then, of course, we constitute uh, or we implement uh, interventions to, to, to control the spread of communicable diseases. And these interventions also need to be evaluated whether they're actually effective or not. So we look at evaluation of effective, uh, or we evaluate the effectiveness of interventions geared towards uh, preventing non-communicable diseases. So um, we need to understand how communicable diseases uh, spread. Uh, so we have uh, a model that is called the uh, epidemiologic triad. This model uh, illustrates how um, uh, communicable diseases occur in individuals. So um, it helps us in understanding uh, the, these, these factors and then now we can uh, use that understanding to institute measures to control the spread of these communicable diseases. So the epidemiologic triad um, consists of three uh, elements. That is the host, and then the agent, and then the environment. When we talk about the susceptible host, we refer to the person who is actually uh, at risk of getting a particular condition. So the person's risk of uh, acquiring a particular condition depends on uh, their health status, uh, their gender, uh, 
their ethnicity or occupation or even lifestyle behaviors. Uh, when we talk about the agent, we refer to that microorganism that can actually transmit, uh, that, that causes the, the health condition. Okay, so for example, if we talk about uh, tuberculosis, then the agent is mycobacteria tuberculosis. So um, this, this agent must have certain properties for it to be able to cause a particular disease in, in a susceptible uh, host. So we look at issues to do like uh, with the uh, infestivity, which is the ability of the organism to be able to enter uh, the host and then multiply and then cause a disease. And then uh, the extent or the ability of this microorganism to cause a disease is what we call pathogenicity. And then we look at virulence, which is the degree of pathogenicity. So um, how fast can a given uh, um, microbial agent cause a disease or cause damage to a, a host or, or to, the, to the organs of the host is related to what we call virulence. So organisms which are uh, which multiply very fast and cause faster damage uh, to the host organs, uh, we say that these organisms are actually very virulent. So they cause uh, injury and death very fast. And then when we talk about uh, immunogenicity, we are referring to the ability of the, uh, of the agent to cause an immune response in, uh, in a host. Basically, the, ag the agent's tactic is to avoid recognition uh, by, the, uh, by the host immune system. But, but also, its ability to evade it is very important. So immunogenicity is the ability uh, uh, to cause an immune response uh, from the host. Uh, these these uh, microorganisms can cause diseases by producing toxins. Okay, so their ability to produce these toxins is what we call uh, toxigenicity. And then the third element of the epidemiologic triad is the environment. This environment is the physical environment in which we live in. Uh, so the location, uh, the climate uh, constitutes the, envir the environment, but also presence of the, the appropriate reservoir. Um, the reservoir has to be in an environment uh, which, um, in which it can actually exist. And then now the, the agent can now be harbored in the, uh, in the reservoir. Okay, so the reservoir has to have the appropriate conditions for survival, and then the agent has uh, now has to be harbored within uh, the reservoir. But also, our environment consists of issues to do with the sanitation, the, the housing conditions, how we dispose waste, and also access to healthcare, and also access to clean water. This all fall under the category of. Uh, uh, the category of the environment. Okay, so without access to clean water, without proper disposal of wastes, without access to uh, quality healthcare, we are susceptible to uh, these communicable diseases. The other aspect that we need to discuss is the chain of infection. The chain of infection is also a model. Uh, just like the, the epidemiologic trial that we have just looked at. It just helps us to understand how uh, infectious diseases are transmitted from uh, one person to the other. If we know how infectious diseases are transmitted from one person to the other, then it is possible that we can actually institute the appropriate ways of uh, controlling these infectious diseases. So the chain of infection consists of uh, six uh, elements. The 
pathogen which we have actually been referring to as the agent, that microorganism which actually transmits the, the, the condition, uh, which results into the condition, or which causes damage uh, in the susceptible host, and then a disease manifesting. And then the reservoir. The reservoir is uh, the, the organism or an inert object uh, that can harbor the pathogen. So the pathogen actually multiplies uh, within the reservoir. So the reservoir can be uh, a human, or it can be an animal, or it can actually be uh, an object. And then the point, uh, the port of uh, the port of, of exit. Is, for example, in the case of, uh, uh, of for example, worms, uh, they, can, uh, they actually exit the body through feces, and then the mode of transmission of these agents uh, could be direct or indirect, as we shall see later on. And then number five is the portal of entry, uh, how, how the micro uh, agent actually enters the human what is called the susceptible host. And then susceptible host is now the person who is actually uh, at risk of getting a particular condition. The transmission of uh, communicable diseases can be horizontal or vertical. Uh, horizontal transmission is when you have transmission from uh, one member of a particular species to another member of the same species. This can be direct or indirect. When we talk about vertical transmission, we are talking about uh, transmission from the mother to the embryo. Uh, this can actually occur uh, uh, when uh, the fetus is still uh, in the uterus or uh, during the process of of delivery or even after delivery during the feeding period. So vertical transmission can occur during pregnancy, during delivery, or even after delivery, especially during uh, breastfeeding. So we have different ways in which diseases can spread from one person to the other. Uh, it can be through uh, direct contact, for example, touching, uh, uh, someone with, a, for example, a skin condition, and then you get that skin condition. Um, or we can have indirect contact, where uh, you uh, touch an object which is inoculated with uh, microbes. Okay. Or you can get a condition through uh, infected air, uh, air droplets uh, in the air. So that is what we call airborne transmission. Or you can get conditions as, um, as a result of taking uh, water that is contaminated, typhoid, for example, cholera, for example. Or you can get what we call foodborne uh, diseases, when you, you consume food that is actually contaminated. Uh, and then we have vector-borne transmission. A vector is an organism that actually carries the disease-causing uh, organism. So for example, for malaria, the vector is a female anopheles mosquito. Yet the causative agent is the plasmodium species. And then zoonotic transmission, which you have already looked at. Uh, these are conditions that are uh, transmitted from animals to humans. So we have individuals that we call carriers. These are individuals who have uh, a pathogen, and then the, uh, they, they are not experiencing the physical signs and symptoms associated with the disease that is being caused by the pathogen, but they have the ability of, um, of spreading this pathogen to other, uh, to other individuals, and then they can catch the disease caused by the pathogen. So those are what you call carriers. Uh, so diseases that can spread uh, by uh, through carriers, uh, for example, uh, diphtheria, dysentery, meningitis, and uh, some ST STDs, and also uh, infections uh, caused by uh, staphylococcus and streptococcal infections. 
So carriers can be those individuals who are actually uh, not uh, exhibiting the signs and symptoms of the disease. Okay, so they just carry the pathogen. These are what we call passive carriers. And then we have people uh, who are capable of transmitting the pathogen and in the period where they have not even managed, they don't have the physical signs and symptoms associated with the disease. Okay, so during the incubation period, they can still be infectious. They can spread the condition to other individuals. Those are the incubatory carriers. And then uh, the convulsive carriers are those that harbor and can transmit the pathogen while recovering from a particular condition. So for example, they have the condition and then they are receiving the treatment and they're after recovery, but they still continue to spread the pathogen to other individuals. And then we have the active carriers. These are individuals who have recovered from the disease, but continue uh, to have the pathogen uh, and, and that they can actually spread it to other individuals. So for example, individuals who, who recover from Ebola can still transmit Ebola even when uh, they have recovered. So there has to be a, a, a given period for which they are not supposed to engage in certain risk activities that can result into the transmission of the Ebola virus. Um, when we look at patterns, we look at uh, um, the numbers or the frequencies associated uh, yeah, with, with which the communicable diseases occur in a particular community or population. So we have uh, endemic patterns, uh, endemic uh, patterns, and also epidemic patterns. Uh, when we talk about epidemic, we mean that the disease is actually happening in a particular location uh, continuously, but usually in lower numbers. So they are always present, but in lower numbers. And then when, when we talk about epidemics, we say that the disease is actually happening at, at, at a level that is higher than usual. So for example, if you have, uh, if you have been having, uh, for example, malaria in a particular location throughout the year, but then when um, particular months come, uh, the, the malaria cases get actually triple uh, the usual numbers. So the malaria actually becomes an epidemic in that, in that locality. Uh, so usually we use what we call epidemic curves to have a representation of the number of cases of a particular uh, epidemic that is occurring in a particular location. This is actually very important because it gives us ideas on how uh, this epidemic is spreading and perhaps what are the points of, uh, uh, of spread. So we use epidemic curves um, because uh, they give us this information which I've just illustrated. But the, the interpretation of these curves is very important. Uh, so and the aspects that you actually need to look at include the time frame, uh, because you actually have you have these curves having the y-axis, which has the number of cases of a particular disease or condition, and then the and the x-axis having the uh, the duration. The duration can actually be whether in days, weeks, or uh, uh, or months, depending on the uh, the natural course of uh, uh, of disease of that particular disease. And then now you, you basically plot, you plot the number of, of cases of a particular disease over time. And then you now, uh, you now can draw a curve connecting uh, the different numbers. And then this basically gives you uh, the shape of the curve. So when you're interpreting the curve, you look at the, the duration, uh, you look at the shape of the curve, you also look at the height of the uh, of the curve, but also another very important interpretation that you can make out of these curves uh, is something to do with the incubation period, which is the uh, the duration uh, for which um, after being exposed to a particular agent, um, how long does it take for you to have the physical signs and symptoms associated with the condition? Okay, and then also if you institute control measures, you should be able to see the epidemic curve 
slowly or sloping downwards. Uh, if it doesn't slope, it perhaps means that um, the measures that you have put across control the spread of these communicable diseases uh, is not actually working out uh, or they are not actually effective. So you need to revisit and see what approaches you have to use in order to flatten the curve. So we have uh, uh, we have different types of, of shapes of, of, the, of, of this epidemic uh, curves. Um, we have one which is actually uh, which has a, a very uh, a very sharp peak in a short time. When you you get a curve like like this, the interpretation is that. Uh, <clears throat> there is a common source of infection, okay? So the individuals who are getting this infection are getting it from one source, okay? Uh, that is the interpretation. So if you get a curve like that, that is the interpretation. It means that there is a point source, okay? So we call this type of curve uh, a point source uh, epidemic curve. And then we have uh, an epidemic curve that is actually spread throughout um, and there is no unique spiking uh, across the different uh, days or even months. Uh, the interpretation of this is that actually uh, the condition is being spread from one person to the other. Um, and therefore uh, you, don't, you don't have a one particular source um, of, uh, of infection. You're having each person acting as a source of that very infection. So you have uh, a slower increase in the number of cases. Uh, okay, so coming back to uh, continuous common source. Um, this is when you actually have one source of infection, but it is sustained. Uh, the, 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 the source of infection is sustained in a way uh, over some period of time. Now, when we talk about propagated uh, outbreak, here we don't have a common source of infection but instead each individual is acting as a source in a way such that you have cases spread uh, across because the individuals are actually spreading one a condition from one person to the other. Okay, and then we have uh, communicable diseases that occur in pandemic proportions. Okay, when we, when we, when we talk about um, a communicable disease, a communicable disease occurring in pandemic proportion, it means that it is actually affecting uh, many countries. So for example, COVID-19 is an example of a pandemic because uh, many countries have been affected with COVID-19. And then we have conditions that occur uh, uh, sporadically. This is to mean that they occasionally appear within the population. Um, but this also means that the condition is actually controlled, but once in a while, the condition actually appears. Um, so we look at the concept of herd immunity, which is that uh, for us to be able to control communicable diseases, we have to uh, vaccinate individuals. But it is not very possible to vaccinate everyone uh, within a, a given community or population. However, if we vaccinate the majority of the people, it means the people who are not vaccinated are in a way going to be protected because the majority of the members of the community have been vaccinated. And that is the concept of herd immunity. So herd immunity can be exploited if uh, about 80% of the population have, have been vaccinated. But also it is very important to realize that had, achieving herd immunity actually varies um, uh, by disease. 
For measles, if you have 94% of the individuals uh, vaccinated, then it is possible to achieve herd immunity. Um, looking at the natural course of disease, a concept that I've been mentioning in this presentation, um, it relates to um, the fact that if you have an individual who has been exposed uh, to a given pathogen, uh, we look at how the condition will actually manifest across the period uh, uh, when the pathogen is within uh, the host. So the initially, the initial step uh, of uh, ha having a disease manifesting is when an, a susceptible individual actually is exposed to a, a pathogen. Okay, so that is the period of exposure. What is actually is very important here is that the pathogen should be uh, sufficient enough to be able to cause damage that will result into having the disease manifesting. So the initial period is usually what we call the, uh, the intubation period. Okay, the intubation period is a period from the exposure up to having the signs and symptoms of the disease. But there is also what you call the latent period. Uh, the, the, the agent is already in the body of the susceptible host and is already having damage that is causing, which we are calling the pathological processes that can be detectable, but today the physical signs and symptoms may not be uh, uh, seen within uh, the patient or the susceptible host. And that period for which uh, there are detectable pathological changes happening because of an agent uh, before the, the manifestation of the clinical signs and symptoms is what we call uh, the latent period. Now, depending on the nature of the condition, uh, you can have people recovering or people actually dying or people actually recovering with residual disabilities. So that is what, they, they, what we term as the, uh, the outcome. So the intubation period is, uh, is what I've just explained. Um, uh, being exposed to a pathogen uh, the period from the exposure to the pathogen to the onset of the signs uh, uh, and symptoms of the disease. And usually what happens during this period is that the, the pathogen is now trying to start to uh, replicate uh, in some insufficient number so that it can cause damage. Uh, this is actually the, the intubation period it varies uh, depending on the nature of the agent, but also uh, how deep it has uh, entered the human body and how much of it has actually entered the human body. If, of course, uh, much of it uh, or the dose of the infectious agent is much, then it is likely that the incubation period is going to be shorter. Um, we have a concept that we call the intrinsic intubation period. Uh, this is basically the interval between the acquisition of the infectious agent, uh, the interval between the acquisition of the infectious agent uh, by, the, by the vector, and then transmitting it to uh, the susceptible host. That, that duration uh, is what we call the extrinsic intubation period. For us to be able to control communicable diseases, uh, we need to institute uh, uh, effective pre prevention and control measures. But uh, there are terminologies that we actually uh, need to understand how to use um, in describing uh, control and, and uh, prevention of communicable diseases. When we say control, we are basically talking about reducing incidence that is reducing the number of new cases of a particular condition, or we are trying to reduce the number of people with a particular condition that is prevalent 
Okay, so we, when we talk about reducing prevalence and instance, that is basically controlling. Uh, when we, talk, we say elimination, we are reducing to, we are actually making sure that the condition is, uh, the, the number of cases of a particular condition are reduced to very low levels. When we talk about eradication, we are basically referring to the fact that there should be no further case of a particular condition. So the, the interventions that we can do uh, include vaccination. Uh, uh, also, we have chemo, uh, antimicrobial chemo, chemotherapy, which is basically using antibiotics, uh, viral, uh, antiviral medication, uh, and all the rest. Isolation and quarantine uh, also uh, help, in, for example, in COVID-19, uh, also certain uh, in contagious conditions, uh, uh, some types of meningitis, or even uh, uh, measles. Isolation and quarantine are very important. And then we talk about health education and promotion, and also controlling vectors, such as controlling uh, mosquitoes through insecticides, through sleeping under mosquito nets or even using biological means uh, to control this. Thank you for listening to this presentation.